Ladies and gentlemen, yes. welcome to Midsummer Scream. There are few groups more passionate and inclusive than horror and Halloween enthusiasts. The fandom openly embraces the LGBT community with pride and empowerment, an all-inclusive fandom that strives to move beyond the boundaries of stereotype, crashing through roles, and loving and terrifying without hesitation. Today, we're going to hear from super monsters in the LGBT community from nearly every color of the screaming rainbow and a range of disciplines as they discuss their own experiences, living, creating, and loving all things horror. Please, welcome to the stage, drag superstar, Justin Andrew Hunar, AKA Alaska Thunderfuck. The commenters always find a way to mention it in the announcement. So, so and so is making history tonight. Oh, history is being made before your eyes tonight. And getting ready for this panel, that occurred to me because I it just I thought if you would just include everyone from the get go, there would be no history that needed to be made. In the first place. <laughs> Our queerness would become shockingly normal, boring even. So, my name is Tom, I'm a writer, uh, I do events in New York and LA, I'm here working this weekend with the Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab Perfume Booth, uh, we recently did a scent for Michael, based on his podcast, Dead for Filth. It smells like blood. It smells like blood. <laughs> I brought a bottle for all of you to, to take home today. Uh, but enough about me, uh, I really, uh, we are gathered here today. <laughs> Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today because each of us have something that everyone else wants, or are doing something that everyone else wants to do. And I include myself in this because I'm up on the stage talking to these people, uh, which is unbelievable to me. Um, but this to me is what representation is all about. It's about getting to make your art. It's about getting to do your work. It's about getting to have the recognition that is so much easier to get if you're white, for example, as, oh my god, all of us seem to be amazing how that can happen so easily if you're not paying attention to certain things. We are an example every day of like what could be and what should be. Uh, the kind of recognition that comes more easily to those who are cisgendered, to those who are straight or straight presenting, like Alaska today. <laughs> Or a male like me when I'm at the DMV. 
<laughs> so, I'm gonna get comfy, but I wanted to start off with a question for all of you, for everybody. Uh, doing what we do and being who we are requires us to become a master at overcoming our own fears. So I wondered if each of you would speak for just a moment about just a simple fear that you've had to overcome uh, in order to get to do what you're doing and to be who you are today. Is that okay? Can we start there? Yeah. All right. Uh, one of them would probably be being on a stage like this. <laughs> yeah. I think for me, um, I was actually just mentioning this to somebody earlier today, is that uh, I don't know one uh, act, trans actress who is working, who has been working for the last decade in Hollywood, who hasn't heard from a casting director that they didn't get a job because they didn't look trans enough, mm. which is kind of odd because it's like, um, we're the trans people. <laughs> um, and a lot of, for me, was to get that out of my head that I couldn't change their minds. And the best advice that somebody gave me to overcome it was, you can be the best in the room and not get the job, and you can be the worst in the room and get the job. So get that out of your head. You just do the best you do, and then the rest will figure itself out. Uh, besides stage fright, uh, my, we talked about this. Oh, stage. it's real. Guys, I just want to let you know. I Do you see how many people are in this room? It's I'm a mess up here. I'm totally wet. Um, <laughs> Do you want a little metallic green lipstick? Because I find it helps. If anyone, it's here. If anyone needs it, I brought that. Up. But I would say that something I had to overcome is uh, the folk, the need to get everything just right. As far as representation goes, we don't have a lot of it, and so it's like whenever I create something, I'm like, ah, oh, God, I hope I get every perspective in here, or just really nail it, and all I can do is tell my own story and hopefully open the door for other people to tell their stories as well, so alleviating that pressure was something I had to overcome. Thank you. I think a lot of times when you talk about the queer relationship to the horror genre, one of the things that we most frequently come to the gates of is that horror is a genre that is about otherness. And who understands otherness more than queer people? And I think that when you uh, live in this space, it's something that you identify with. But one fear that I think every queer person has to overcome is that otherness is something to be celebrated. And so I think that for me, it was just realizing at some point, you are enough, and you are enough. And I think that, uh, you know, if I were to go back and give myself any advice, because this all seemed so foreign when I was a kid, it was like, stay spooky. Because look at where it will take you. And like, one day Midsummer Scream will exist. Yeah. So yeah, that's all I gotta say. Very cool. um, I have to say one thing I had to overcome is just being a young woman and owning businesses um, and the fear of being taken seriously, uh, whether it's negotiations or trying to promote my businesses. I think one thing I had to overcome is, you know, being a woman and being strong and, and representing, you know, even being gay and being taken seriously. I guess that was always just a fear. Um, Does that get any easier? It did, it did get easier. Mm -hmm. And now I don't have that fear anymore, but I would say years ago, it was very difficult for me. I had a fear of how I was viewed and a fear that my businesses wouldn't take off based on how people viewed me. Um, I no longer have that fear, but that was definitely one obstacle that I had to come over, uh, get over. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's it. Hi. <laughs> um, I was afraid of um, never having sex again when I was younger, and I was like coming into drag and like. Cause I was like, there was this guy that I was kind of seeing, and he was like, if if you do drag, I can't, we can't do it, we can't see each other. <laughs> and so I was like afraid. I was like, is this just how it's gonna be? But and so at a certain point, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna like lean into that fear and like go toward it. And I was like, I'm gonna be as gay and as draggy and ridiculous as I just feel like I am inside. 
And, um, and that was the <laughs> Please tell me this person is still single. <laughs> like, forever. <laughs> not everyone does drag, so he's not getting laid up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so while you have the microphone, can I ask you another question? Yes. Um, so, so we've been talking about a lot of our interest in horror from the beginning, and a lot of our inspiration comes from being an outsider. You know, your career has taken off so much, uh, do you even, do you still feel like an outsider? Because I know yes. That, yes. Has your inspiration yeah. changed as a result of finding so many people and uh, having so many people accept you? You know, like, where, 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 where does it come from? The same place? Well, I mean, it's great that, like, more eyeballs are on drag and, like, more people know what it is. Like, I love that. And we get so many crazy opportunities right now. Like, like, I, like I'm in the choir room and uh, and I'm in Sharpie Six and Ask Controller Nine. <laughs> but like, that's really great. But like, there's still like a long way to go because sometimes I feel like as a drag queen, I I feel like a hired like someone's chihuahua literally gets treated better than like drag queens do on set. Sometimes it's like, no, like, oh, you're 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 drag queen, so you you don't get paid, but the dog gets its own dressing room in a car. Oh, damn. I heard that from a lot of uh, like uh, Lipsinka I had talked to back in the day because yeah. uh, it was like you know stop doing a lot of gigs because it was like they want me there at eight in the morning in full drag ready to go for not enough money and I, why would anyone do that? Yeah, so. Speaking of the choir room, uh, Sam, will you tell us about the choir room? Tell us a little bit about it. Sure, uh, the choir room is a short film. Uh, it's a horror piece about this guy, Michael, who attempts suicide and fails, and in doing so, inadvertently triggers a psych ward urban legend. Um, Hattie, a demonic presence played by the very talented <laughs> It's a it's a queer horror story with uh, diverse casting and some pretty great uh, talent. Uh, the, the, I watched uh, the trailer is online, and you can watch that. Like, wait till the end of the panel. If you don't mind, <laughs> turn the volume all the way down, at least. I appreciate well, that. We're also screening it here. Yes. Oh, great. Yes. <laughs> so, but I mean, like, people are like, like right now, they're just like, quiet room, quiet room. Absolutely. We'll, we'll do a whisper campaign, so everyone will make sure to see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one thing I, I wanted to ask you about, Sam, was that uh, how much horror, because we're all doing it, like it becomes, it's also a big part of our personal lives and how we connect socially and romantically, you know, like if you're meeting people like romantically and you wind up watching, we watch horror movies. We end up bonding over like, oh, have you seen this? Or, you have to see this. You know, are there like movies that you like save to show to people like that or like watch or like that you like on a date? Yeah, or the, yeah, like if you're gonna date someone, like, is there a movie that you, they have to see to date you? Uh, so here's the thing, I don't like to watch horror movies on dates because I'm like really into the movie. And that's, <laughs> I'm not a good movie date. Cause like, I, I don't want to talk over it, unless it's like trash and then I want to talk over the whole thing. And hate that. Um, but I love trash and then I, I love actual horror films like Black Christmas 1974 would be like, yeah. Um, that would be essential viewing uh, in order to be in a relationship. Yeah. Are you asking me, huh? I mean, I mean, you know, like I'm kind of asking all of you out, like one by one. We're just like working the the list. Um, I want to know if anyone else has movies like that, though. If there's like stuff that you just have bond with people over, or that you like love to watch on dates, or besides your own movies. <laughs> Never show people your own movies on a date. I don't know. Never. You could learn a lot real fast. I don't know if it's a date movie, but one of my biggest movies that somebody needs to watch is Audition. And I love... I, 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 I will defend to the death that that movie has a happy ending. I don't care what perspective you came to it from. That's a happy ending. Um, wait, keep that microphone for a second, because I wanted to ask you about American Horror Story. And, uh, <laughs> magic word. Um, and if you, uh, what, would you just share one of your favorite memories from 
being on the set of American Horror Story? Um, oh my gosh. I think one of my favorite moments was um, I was working, uh, a couple of us who were doing the scene were kind of like huddled, waiting for our time to come in, and... Um, wait, wait, let people know exactly like what you were doing on the show, too, so that they, oh, in case they... Um, I was on the American Horror Story Roanoke season, and I was on uh, one of the episodes where they were doing the documentary, and I'm playing one of the people who was auditioning alongside uh, Kathy Bates. Um, and I remember <laughs> one of the first things that happened is I got on set and uh, we were all kind of waiting there and suddenly you hear from this room in the corner. You can say whatever you want, right? Yeah. <laughs> I hear, you motherfucker, you son of a bitch, I'm gonna get you for that. And then suddenly the door opens and Kathy Bates just walks out. Just <laughs> and we were all looking at each other going like, it just happened. Because we had no idea what they were shooting at the yeah. time. Um, the other thing is the season that I shot was uh, completely crowded in secrecy to the point where I'm a huge fan of American Horror Story and when I auditioned, I had no idea what I was reading for. I, it was just like, here are a couple lines, go in and do it three different ways. And when we got on set, it was like, okay, here are these pages, but everything was under production names. Like, we had nothing I learned, kind of, as it was coming out as well, even though I worked on it. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't make Kathy Bates do that, probably, do they? Uh, I, you know what? She has said some pretty uh, nasty stuff on the show, so yeah. I wouldn't hold it past her. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, one thing that I think that is really interesting about being an LGBTQ artist is like having to manufacture yourself along the way and find out how you fit in the world. And uh, I wanted to, Jacqueline, I wanted to talk to you especially because you are like a, like a one person band, like you do it all. You're like, you know, writing and editing and directing and producing stuff and like sometimes it's all your own stuff and for other people. And it's like, so when I moved to New York City at 22, uh, I was like, I believed that I could not possibly do everything, or even, I, I, I decided to try to work as a writer because I didn't think you could do, be a writer and a performer. You had to find one thing and you had to focus because there's so many other people doing stuff. How are you going to do these things? Like, so I just think, I imagine this, yeah, I had to specialize, you know, in order to succeed. And like looking around at the people that I see who are really thriving, like they can do so many things. So. Um, is this something that you that you had to learn, or is this just how you started out? Well, when I first started filmmaking um, in, in indie film, they they told you that you had to specialize, that you had to pick one thing you wanted to do on a film set, and that was all you could do. And I hated I hated that because I loved every aspect of filmmaking, which is part of why I love directing because you're so much a part of everything. But um, for Shock Attack, I had to learn a whole lot of everything. <laughs> It was a really low budget film, and when you work on low budget films, you have to, you know, put on a lot of hats, and it was the first time doing a lot of that stuff. So from there, I can make my own movies, and then I can also, you know, shoot and edit and whatever I need to do on set to make sure things get done. Mm -hmm. uh, and how, how does that, um, well, first of all, um, will you give people, in case they haven't seen a shock attack, like, like the elevator pitch? Uh, it's about a killer electric eel. That's it. That's yeah. it. <laughs> so, and in your opinion, having worked in so many different areas, like, what's the best work that you've done in like any like capacity? Like, what's the thing where you're like, oh my god, that like I nailed it. Uh, well, hopefully that'll be deprivation. Most most of the time, I'm just trying to get as much work out as possible, and and really, especially now, while you have your own equipment, you have access to a lot of things, it's great to get as much out there. Um, but I have a short film called Deprivation that I've been working on for a couple of years now. And um, I'm taking my time with that one, and hopefully that will be that at the end of it. Deprivation. Deprivation. Um, well, uh, Rachel, do you have a microphone down there? I know we only have a few to pass around. Hello. So hello. So I know, so some of us up here are like working in horror like all the time. It's like what we're doing all the time. Some of us it's just like, you know, gig to gig. Like who knows what you could get like, you know, like with Julie, like you could get cast to do literally anything. So you're someone who kind of like lives in fear year round. Yes. Right? <laughs> like how, 
how do you keep that fresh for yourself? You know, like, do you do you ever burn out? Do you? Uh, horror in general? Yeah. Uh, year round? Oh no, I don't burn out. <laughs> I love horror. Um, it's my passion. It's my passion. It's it, what's it's it makes me tick. You know. Um, I have done other things and other businesses that are not horror related, and I just did not get satisfaction out of it like I do in the horror industry. I read a little bit, I read in, I think it was an interview with, with you or a profile talking about, you know, you getting started and moving to the city. I mean, it was kind of like a, like a the quintessential kind of showbiz story where someone moves to the city, um, you know, with no real expectations or idea of like what kind of support you're going to find. Um, like, uh, what, what do you have to say to other people who are doing that, you know, like, what did you find out, like, do you think that what happened to you can happen to other people? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I was in a really mundane, like, job and, and doing things that I just wasn't passionate about, wasn't happy in, I was very discontent, and I just decided, it was around Halloween time, I just decided, you know what, I'm gonna do something in the horror industry and something that I wanna see if it works out and if I, if I enjoy it, if other people enjoy what I'm doing. And um, I think me just sticking with my passion and, and, and moving forward in that, and, and really, not really giving myself an option right. for anything else. Like, it's not an option to be discontent at right. this point. Like, I was very unhappy. And um, I think if anyone gets to that point, I think they need to make a decision, how can I move on where I can be fulfilled and be happy, do what I love, and do it the best I possibly can right. to promote happiness in myself, but as long as it's giving to others as well, and then it's sustainable. And a lot of people just do not have that safety net, especially in the LGBTQ community. Like there's, you know, going home is not an option. Right. You know, like calling your parents for money is not necessarily an option. I never had that option. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, my parents were like, if it doesn't work out in New York, call us and we will buy you a plane ticket home. And that was like the extent, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh. I fear that. Yeah. Like, I don't want to go home <laughs> yeah. to Boston, you know. Um, I just, I love where I'm, I, I love LA, I love this industry, and I, well, the word you said, industry, like, you, I love that you said the word horror industry, because L.A. has a horror industry. Yeah. And not every city has that. Not even every big city really has that. Like, everyone's doing their own thing, and, like, productions, like, come through and everything. But with L.A., like, one of the reasons why I think Midsummer Scream and, you know, other conventions here are so great is because they reflect, like, the interests and, like, the work of all of the people. And even if you go out on that showroom floor in there and you see people who, for whom this is like a big business and this is like M365 and you see people who save up to do events like this mm -hmm. and they strategically come and they like hand make things and they're like, this is, you know, to, to be part of that industry. So, um, hey Michael, I haven't talked to you in a minute. Okay, I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> you're still here. So, so you're, I mean, everyone here is outspoken in their own way, but, um, I love you because you are a super outspoken proponent of queer rights and everything that that entails. And I, uh, there's an interview that I wanted to, uh, uh, the, the, a clip from an interview with you that I read on iHorror that said, if you're watching a movie or a TV show and you have a problem that there are queer people in it or black people or strong female characters, then go away. We don't need you. <laughs> So, I did say that. I just want to offer you an opportunity to double down on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want me to double down on it, like, it's 2018. If yeah. you have a problem with representation, diversity, uh, or anything, like, a, a more diverse world of media, get the fuck out. Yeah. Like, that's it. I mean, honestly, we, as queer people, spent a whole lifetime watching art that wasn't made for us, and yet we still managed to connect to it, we still managed to find ourselves in those characters, so you know what, it's your turn. Yeah. And we're not taking roles away, we're bringing more, that's it. There's a more diverse place out there, there's more platforms for media, so let's use that. Right. Period. <laughs> I think he's clapping, it's fine. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so one of the things that I love about you is, um, is you're working on literally everything all the time. And of all the people I know in the world, you have such a flair for titles. Okay, okay. So I wanted you to um, run down some of the, uh, your favorite titles of stuff that you've done. Uh, uh, to share them with people here. Just some of the titles that I've created. Yeah, just um, titles. Well, there was Flesh for the Inferno, which was about killer nuns. Uh, there was Fondue or Die, about a, a cheese party gone wrong. <laughs> I just uh, wrote last year a short called uh, From Hell She Rises, which was a feminist vampire piece. Uh, I should just like, uh, the wrong stepmother for lifetime coming this fall. <laughs> it's true. Uh, yeah, I mean, are there specific titles that I, I feel like you're on the edge of some sort of... Oh, there, well, I, I've thought about it because of your upcoming thing. Slay Gardens. Slay Gardens. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to give you say. Okay, Slay Gardens, I will qualify, is a film I am co-writing with a very dear and old friend, Peaches Christ. Yes. <laughs> so, since Peaches isn't here that I know of, would you like to go ahead and take credit for the title? Completely? Is, it, is this Michael's title? I uh, will plead the fifth. Uh, <laughs> because she has a tendency to appear, as Alaska knows, when you least expect it. Oh, you can summon her just by saying her name. Yeah, it is a powerful name in she's literature. Gonna, she's gonna candy man us in here. Yes. <laughs> um, so I have some questions for kind of anyone who wants to answer. And if you don't want to answer, just like, duck, like, duck out of the way. Um, we got, just be sure to pass the microphone. Just grab one out of someone's hands. Um, we've all had to fight for our place here. Um, so, okay. Well, first of all, um, I want to like look out to the audience too, because also like, so we. F I know a big theme in horror is that we fear what we don't understand, and like we've been using the word queer pretty liberally up here. Um, like I wanted to see like in the audience, like how many people here identify as queer. Show of hands, you, you can close your eyes if that helps. Okay, a sizable amount of people. Uh, how many, are there people here who are, aren't really sure what that means or like what, what the difference is? Um, I'm not gonna call on you. So. <laughs> I, however, will. <laughs> Michael might call on you. Um, I really, is there anyone, so I, I guess we don't really have to explain it to anyone. There, I think there's like, there's a child here in the front row who even knows what it means. Yeah, she's like, yeah. yeah exactly. but you know, like, it's one of the things that's really tough in terms of representation, and, and I just want to touch on this, is we even, you know, we had a difficult time even being able to work the word queer into our, the description of our panel, because there's still a lot of fear. And when you're putting out something to the general public, like, you don't know, I guess, you know, you don't always under, know that everyone will understand. You know, um, but this event, which is, you know, queer as fuck, and the audience, which is queer as fuck, we can handle it. So, you know, how hard are we supposed to fight for others to be included? You know, like, how do we, how hard do we push back? Like, where is the line? Like, how do you stand up and say, like, this needs to be said, or like, this person needs to be included? Especially if you know that, like, it might, you know, keep you from ending up being included yourself in something. Well, before, I just want to say, for me, the easy answer is, until everyone's included, period, full stop, done. I don't think it should be a big discussion. I think it's, you know, the whole reason and need for representation is because we are not fully represented yet and there are some people that are still waiting. So until everyone is represented, if it makes someone else, it goes back to what we just talked about. If it makes somebody uncomfortable, they need to learn to deal with it. Like that's just, you know, right. we're all here. We share one earth. Right. So until everyone is included. Right. And in the meantime, you can't guarantee that like someone who thinks that way is in, in every room where decisions are being made for that they will be listened to even if they agree. So anyone else? My, my personal opinion is if you want to include a group or a specific um, unrepresented minority is talk to them let them tell their stories let them speak for themselves because i feel like so there's so much and i know this is kind of like seen as a bad word but there's a lot of virtue signaling out there of people who want to do good but they don't understand that when you're speaking for a group without being part of that group 
you're not actually doing anybody any favors. And I'll give you a big example for horror that I just lost my mind over last year is um, it seems like every year in the haunt community there's some sort of like big hoopla or press something gone bad within like Knox or Universal or something. And I, I remember last year um, people, th there was a VR experience at Not Scary Farm and people were trying to talk for, uh, talk for people uh, who have experienced mental health issues saying that this is bad for them, this, 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 this causes stigma. And meanwhile, there were a lot of us who use horror as ways of overcoming our own difficulty in mental health, saying, no, you're not speaking for us. This is actually helping us. This is how we get through trauma. Don't take this away from us by speaking over us, thinking that you're doing us any favors, because you're not. To speak on that, like with the Quiet Room trailer, when we released it, we had a lot of excitement, which was great. And so, uh, but we also had some people in, in the comments or people message us and just that we're really concerned because we tackle issues about mental health. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, who are you to tell this story? And I think that's a great thing to ask and we should definitely interrogate. But also, you know, for me personally, I'm telling my story. You know, and hopefully I'm telling somebody else's. I can't get theirs right, but I can get mine right. Yeah. So I know that when I'm true to the thing that I experience or incorporating that into um, into my work, then that's how I can kind of pull other people in. Um, but it I, it becomes challenging if it's not my story to tell. That was a magical thing for me. As a, I was a guest on Michael Brody's podcast recently, Dead for Filth, and uh, now available as a perfume by Black Phoenix. And I just had never had anyone like ask me details about my story, my story like that, for that long. And I was like, it was it really meant a lot to me. I was like, oh yeah, and it's recorded. And there it is. And it made me realize, you know, we're all doing our thing, we're all telling our stories, including people, but like, I, I forget what that feels like. Queer stories matter. Queer, queer stories matter, our history matters. It's so important to me to preserve it in the horror space, because when I was a kid, we didn't have it. There were allusions to it. It was like, James Whale is gay, he made Frankenstein, <laughs> but it's coded. But like, what if we had an hour to hear him talk about what that was like in Hollywood in the 30s? You know, and there are so many amazing queer creators, many of whom have been on the show, many of whom I still can't wait to have on. Yeah. And I would, it's not about me, it's about them. It's your story, it's his story, it's her story. It's everybody's story that we just need to give to other people. Right, it's important. Thank you, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, um... <laughs> We should just stop sentence by sentence so everyone can applaud, like, <laughs> like yeah. Um, so one thing that gets overlooked is because I know we all, if you feel a responsibility to like represent the community and to tell queer stories, we're all interested in lots of different shit that people might not expect. And this is like why I mentioned like watching a lot of wrestling. There's a lot of queer wrestling fans. People don't realize it. They are out there. You know, and like the the rest of the WWE is starting to take notice uh, in their weird way, uh, but like all of us have interests that people might not expect us to have, or like stories that we want to tell that someone might not ex associate with us because we only we have done horror or stuff for the community. I was just curious if you've got a microphone down there. If well, what's the, is there anything you know like if you weren't busy doing, you know, everything. Like, do you, you there, there's, what are some interests that you have that might surprise people or that you would love to explore? Um, I really love Star Trek The Next Generation. Yeah. Oh, I know this one. I've been really into it lately. And I love, um, The Golden Girl. Yeah! I saw you at Golden Girl Live. I sat right next to you and you were like, doing something like right by my head and I was frozen. I just did not want to interfere in the performance in the slightest because I was probably grinning like an idiot. It's like right, like you made oh, it. Oh, that was you. Yeah, yeah. that was me. <laughs> you were like, was it making a salad or something or a pasta or something right by my head? There was some business, some stage business. It was wonderful. Do you think, do you guys know about Golden Girls Live? Yeah! Yeah, I can know. Yeah. So wait, I just have to stop for what is I have to look at this. Are these gloves? Yes. On the hat. 
These are gloves. Look at that. I was like, what? So good, I love that. This is how, if you're a widow and you definitely killed him, this is how you like, this is how you let everyone in the funeral know why there are no fingerprints at the crime scene. Thank you so much. I made this. And I wore it specifically tonight to hide behind because I was so terrified. <laughs> I said tonight because it's like we're like in showbiz, so it's always tonight. tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, who else? Well, let's, I want to hear what your like non-queer, non-horror related interests are. Like, what subjects would you love to explore if given the time and opportunity and the uh, producerial dollars, for example? I love Resident Evil yes. on on PlayStation. <laughs> I think Resident Evil 2 is my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anything? She's like, no. <laughs> That's because she is like ride or die. That's how you know this is like a life. This was a this was like a test. Horror. Yeah. Horror. <laughs> All I'm horror. Not gonna, uh, I don't know. I'm a comic book nerd. It's not so secret, but I am. Uh, Give me some, give me some Nightwing. Yeah. I, for the people who know, all of Bruce Wayne's progeny, but out without him, he's problematic, but he's got a lot of cool peeps around. I'm into it. Uh, you know, for someone who's supposed to be a crazy loner, Batman's got a bigger entourage than Taylor Swift. Uh, but yeah, that's it. I started watching Death Note recently. Uh, so I guess I'm, I am really that nerd. I'm here, I'm ready, and I love it. Oh, oh. Um, I have a Tamagotchi that died yesterday. No, I know, I've been going for it. Um, so, but aside from like bad toys, which is like a legit interest of mine, I know. Um, Christmas. I like love Christmas. I had a Christmas podcast like seven years ago. It's a whole thing. I will, Christmas, I thought my movies at home are divided. There's Christmas, made for TV Christmas, Christmas horror, then horror by holiday. So they're just, it's, it's a whole thing. But uh, actually, I sneak Christmas into most of my movies somehow. We were supposed to have a scene in the quiet room where it snows, um, but it ended up just being a bunch of like dried uh, mashed potato stuff, and that's not cute. So. <laughs> <laughs> kind of in a weird way, because um, part of this convention and horror in general has, is where immersive theater started. And I say that it kind of encompasses for me now, because that's why I got into it. It's because I was part of the horror community, and then I realized that the amount of storytelling and emotions that you can impart on an audience is so much more diverse than just horror. Like, I've been in immersive experiences that are not have anything to do with horror where I'm leaving crying, actually feeling something that I've never felt watching a movie or watching a play. And I, that's that's it for me. That's, that's pretty much it. That, that was pretty much what I was gonna say. I love, I'm totally obsessed with immersive experiences, even though it's still, there's a lot in horror too. But I would, I would love to be behind the scenes of one of those, or, or you know, be able to direct a writer, something. Yeah. Because I'm just obsessed with it. Well, let's like take that back to Rachel as an opportunity to give her a question that she can, that she will answer. Um, because as someone who works in this world, I would imagine that there are lots of people who go into immersive theater environments and stuff to just like express parts of themselves they don't. Get, have access to on a regular basis in kind of like a safe anything goes environment. Like, do you, you know, like, do you get a lot of reactions from people? Do you think people are experimenting by participating in immersive theater? Absolutely. I, and, and I think as a creator, I think for me, what I'm passionate about is actually creating experiences where you can promote an emotional response in them and actually have them. Um, interact with a character that they maybe vibe more than a different character and, and creating characters different where um, it kind of makes people able to connect to s someone or a character and be able to express maybe more deeply and feel like it's more of a safe place because um, it is immersive theater it's not like the real world of maybe they're going through something and need to talk to their family about or their friends about. They actually have a safe space where it's a pretend world, yeah. 
but maybe they're looking more deeper in themselves and being able to express that more. Are, are you able to, um, I'm curious what you, when you talk about safety, because I know some theater projects like Never Sleep, uh, it's, uh, what is it? Uh, sleep No More. Sleep No More, I must have Never Sleep Alone, which is a totally different show. Uh, <laughs> sleep No More, you know, has had a lot of problems recently with performers because it's like they get people drunk and they're in there and then like rules are not necessarily known, you know? So like also I guess it can create problems. Like how do you as a creator kind of like set things up so that it's, the smoothest for everybody. Well, if we're talking specifically about the Count's Den and, and that immersive environment, um, you know, we're fairly new and haven't had many outside people out of our immersive community here in Los Angeles to come in. Um, we kind of have a good inner circle of people, and from there, they invite people from the outside that can come in. And we do have larger events, and but in those large events that are ticketed events that anybody can come to those, um, all the staff and the characters all know who they've already talked with, who's already been um, at the Count's Den. It's like a cult. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, we have a safe word in between all the characters and everyone there. If, if we feel like there's someone there being inappropriate, um, we make sure we all know that, and we're kind of a family there. So, I mean, it, it might be different in other immersive experiences where it's like a one-off, maybe like night shift or something that I did, where you have a lot of the public coming mm -hmm. through, and, and you manage that by waivers and safe words. Right. And really Do you mean a, a bouncer because like yeah, security someone and at like, the door yeah. is just like... You know, but um, for what I'm doing right now, where it's an actual membership location of an immersive environment, it's, I, I created it specifically to get to know people and they keep coming back and we build this family and we build this community and this environment where um, we're all really comfortable and we all know who we are, yeah. Well, thank you. So, we don't have all the time in the world here today. And I, I'm aware that there may be some of you in the audience who have questions, and I hesitantly open the floor <laughs> to audience questions on the provision that you do not waste our fucking time. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> but if, if there are any questions from the audience, uh, yes, you? Um, what character in cin cinema, TV, anything like that inspires you, which, uh, inspires you and what you do? Anyone? I have one. <laughs> Always at the back of my head. She's actually a little more popularized is Claudia from Interview with a Vampire. Um, I feel like when I saw, when I saw her story, I was 12 when I watched Interview with a Vampire for the first time. It's the first time that I actually was able to um, understand through another character what it's like to be in a body that isn't yours or doesn't feel comfortable to you. Um, another character is Sadako from the Ring series. She is my absolute favorite fictional character of all time because she's so complex and she's actually intersex. Most people don't. Uh, that's not part of like the U.S. version. But that's what intrigues me. Uh, uh, I think that, you know, one of the most referenced films on Dead for Filth by many queer guests is Carrie. And even though Carrie doesn't necessarily, on um, the upfront, seem like a queer character, her whole journey, the otherness that she experiences, the ostracization, uh, and it's really made me realize that for all these years, I definitely identify with Carrie, and I have a sorrow for her because she didn't get to become the person that she needed to. And uh, it's, it's sort of a dark narrative of how this world can, can turn queerness against people. Uh, and so there is like an idea to me that uh, Carrie is identifiable, but even, even though I know the outcome and Nancy Allen hiding in the wings. Mm. Oh my God, uh, don't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Oh my God. Uh, there, I still always wanted to work out for her, and it doesn't. But and I think that you know, there's always uh, going to be that for any queer person because there's still that. It goes back to the very first question. There's that fear. There's that fear inside of us that, no matter how accepting it is, uh, society places that doubt. And uh, so Carrie's very relatable to me. And I saw you clap when I mentioned Nightwing. So Midnight would be a second because uh, he likes Nightwing. Glass. Like yeah. yeah. always watching the audience. Yeah. Um, uh, you have a question. Um, 
I'll drop the mic for her. <laughs> so what, like any movie? Any single movie. Well, um, uh, I just really want to do that scene in Batman Returns where um, Selena Kyle comes home from the office. <laughs> And she listens to her, her voicemail and just... <laughs> and then she makes an outfit out of the rubber coat that's in her closet. I want to do that. I love that. Um, real quick, if anyone wants to take a swing at this, I just wanted to ask... Uh, What's the most exciting thing that you have going on right now that you're technically not supposed to talk about? <laughs> we're just, we're so family here. No one's gonna say anything. Anyone? <laughs> I knew someone would take the bait. Huh? I've been sitting on something, but no, I can't talk about it. <laughs> Can you follow like, me on Twitter? Do the right. Well, yes, do that anyway. Can you do some charades or something? Like anything? Like you technically uh, said nothing. Uh-huh. You got that? People are anyone who's been <laughs> filming this, we're gonna analyze this after. Okay? I'm I'm developing a feature version of the choir room. So <laughs> Oh my god, I wanted to ask about that so bad that I was afraid the answer was just going to be depressing. Aww. No, it's... The, that's it's, so it's been, cool. It, the, yeah, it's been a really exciting year, and good things are coming. Oh. So. Congratulations. We'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll, this, uh, it's California. We'll see what happens. But, like, that's, that's really incredible. Yeah, the response has been so cool, um, and just seeing that many people get excited about it, so... Yeah. Excellent. Um, I'm doing a horror anthology. It's going to be a series. Um, and it's called POV in the Shadows. Everything's shot in a POV style until whatever the reveal is for every episode. So it's going to be a fun one. I guess something that I shouldn't talk about, but I'm really excited about. Um, for those of you that don't know, I own an immersive theater lounge in downtown Los Angeles that is membership and, and private invite. And what I'm really excited about what we're moving into is really personalizing um, our shows and the content of our shows to the participants and the members that are coming. Um, so we have a lot of, right now we're doing a vampire origin series of all the different characters inside the den and creating episodes um, immersive experiences based on those characters and what I'm excited about is we're actually going to keep a whole database on our members <laughs> so that it's we like know Westworld. it's like Westworld yeah. this is so great. that's just Westworld spoiler but. so that we know exactly what their comfortability levels are and exactly what makes them tick in these immersive experiences you are evil oh <laughs> yeah anyone else Uh, well, in addition to Slay Gardens with uh, Peaches and Jinx, um, we've got... Uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. Um, <laughs> smooth. It's a musical. Uh, uh, I also just uh, signed on the dotted line to direct a uh, new short film called We Eat Our Own. It's set in West Hollywood. You can figure it out. Uh, and we're gearing up for the Dead for Filth live Halloween special. Which may or may not feature a certain lady associated with the night. And that's all I'm gonna say. Oh. A certain lady. A certain lady. A certain lady. Is it, is it me? It's <laughs> definitely Tom Black. Is, that, is, you, is there anything that you can say? Um, uh, well, you can make well, something up, and we'll all just go crazy waiting for it. <laughs> well, um. Uh, my best friend Jeremy and I have been working on some music, and we um, we went into the woods and we wrote a bunch of music, and so that's happening pretty soon. And I have been trying to really keep it a surprise, but um, don't tell anyone. No <laughs> um, and also Sharknado uh, comes out on Spotify. Yeah. 
I am totally allowed to talk about that, and I'm just really excited about it. And my niece is really excited. She's eight, and she loves Sharknado. Oh, my God. That's wonderful. I'm looking around for, like, signs that someone's going to run up and take microphones away from us. I know that we're, like, over time. It's about that time. Is it really? Um, I just want to say that yesterday when I was at the perfume booth and we had some flyers out for this panel, so many people came up and talked about it or picked, took a flyer, but like also there were a lot of people who were heartbroken because they were just here for one day. They were here for Saturday. You're sitting in a seat today that maybe someone from yesterday would have loved to have. So, um, what? So, if you enjoyed today's event and today's conversation, I urge you to reach out to Midsummer Scream. Um, you can send an email, you can make a social media post, you can tag us, tag the convention and everything. Or you could just say something to an employee here today about how much you enjoyed it. Because let me tell you, there is room to expand and we would love, I would love to see like next year if we had an event for people on both days so that like, so that everyone who was here, if they could just scratch together money for one ticket for one day, um, they could have something like the experience we're having here today. Main stage. Main, oh, what? Main stage? That would be fine. I'm going with main stage. Or whatever. Uh, thank you all so much for carving out space in a very busy afternoon. Um, I'm glad that we had a place for you to sit down and rest for a minute. Some of you are probably just like straight and needed a rest. <laughs> Uh, but that's okay, because we welcome everyone, and you might have learned something. I want to thank everyone on our panel for joining us. Jennifer, Sam, Michael, Rachel, Ross. And thank you all for coming out. Thank you for Horror Buzz, for producing the event, and for missing the stream, for having us. May they not live to regret it. Uh, have a wonderful convention, everyone. If you want to smell dead for filth, I'll be slathering it on people at the Perfume Lab in about 45 minutes in flats. <laughs>